so our uh, next speaker is uh, no stranger to me because we worked together for several years while I was at Rothamsted, um, Eric Ober, and Eric uh, is now uh, has moved over to Niab, uh, which is in Cambridge, a slightly more fun city than Harpenden, um, but, uh, but also uh, a great place to do good science. And Eric's uh, talk is uh, entitled, Testing the Efficacy of Large-Scale Field Phenotyping in Genomic Selection to Accelerate Wheat Breeding. Eric. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, a new project that uh, we've started uh, in collaboration with the Rosalind Institute, uh, John Hickey and Chris Gaynor. You might know John from uh, his work at CIMIT not too long ago. Uh, so this project's called uh, G plus E, Genomic Selection and Environment Modeling for Next Generation Wheat <coughs> Breeding. Uh, I think relevant for this audience, there's, there's a number of objectives for the project, but uh, today I think uh, two objectives are relevant. First, simulation and empirical analysis of the effect of training population design on the efficacy of routine early generation genomic selection in real wheat breeding programs. So that's for Greg and the breeders in the audience. And secondly, design and evaluate cost-effective processes for capture of high-dimensional phenotype descriptors and environmental covariates on a large number of trial plots for estimation of environmental and genetic effects in prediction algorithms. So that's for the statisticians and the phenotypers in the audience. Let me uh, just give you a kind of a, a really brief introduction to genomic selection, and I apologize to the experts in the audience that this is very superficial, but just to give you an idea of what this is about. A training population is phenotyped and genotyped to construct a prediction algorithm or equation. This equation is used to predict the breeding values of unphenotyped individuals. Because you don't need to phenotype them, this allows for reduction of the breeding cycle to accelerate the release of finished varieties. Um, a sufficient number of markers, and in wheat we reckon about 10,000 markers, uh, plus the use of imputation can capture a large proportion of the genetic variation to make accurate predictions about breeding values. And similarly to the genotyping process, uh, to saturate the phenotype with descriptors of the phenotype. And that allows better separation of environmental and genetic components and to generate more precise phenotypes. So <clears throat> the structure of our project is, is um, like this. So we're collaborating uh, with four commercial breeding companies. Their logos were on the, the first slide. They represent about 80% of the UK uh, market share. And each of the company performed 11 crosses uh, that they would do in their normal breeding programs uh, with elite lines. And from those chose 68 F2 um, derived F4 lines per cross. So that uh, leads to about 3,000 lines per trial. The important thing is the scale of this is required to really test uh, the accuracy of these genomic prediction algorithms. It does present a little bit of a challenge for phenotyping. Uh, the genotyping is done with an AFI uh, 35K SNP chip. Uh, then we put in the mix seven commercial variety checks, a few barley uh, marker plots so we don't get lost when we're in the middle of 3,000 plots in the field. And these are drilled to two by six meter yield plots. There's two locations uh, with, on contrasting soil types, and the uh, experiment will be conducted over two years. We've just finished the first year. So that's 3,100 plots per location and 6.2 hectares to phenotype. Um, so, uh, what are we looking at? Well, the principal trait of interest is grain yield. Our bottom line is, is yield in farmers' fields, and the best we can estimate that is on uh, yield plots in trials. But we're also trying to get as many phenotypic descriptors as possible. So there's some visual scoring of phenological growth stages like flowering date, ons, uh, presence or absence of ons, uh, wax, uh, senescence, establishment percent, uh, incidence of yellow rust. That's a lot of kilometers that Rob Jackson, our postdoc on the project, walked uh, this summer. But most of the phenotyping is done by remote aerial sensing using UAV, uh, RGB uh, images, multi-spectral, two different companies we worked with, one with a three-band, another five-band camera. 
on six time points uh, with flights going from early uh, growth through to senescence, including a bare earth flight. So we had a baseline for the digital surface model to estimate height. And also one flight using a manned aircraft with hyperspectral uh, imaging. In addition to that, we want to gather as many environmental covariates uh, as possible. So we looked at soil conductivity, uh, soil fertility uh, variations, and of course, weather. So let me introduce to you uh, our state-of-the-art phenotyping tools. Uh, this is a plot combine. It's actually a very high-tech bit of equipment. It's pretty expensive, but it's indispensable uh, because, as we said, grain yield is the uh, bottom line for everything, and I don't see us dispensing with that anytime soon. The other um, bit of uh, equipment is uh, Phil Howell, who's our, our breeder in our wheat breeding pre breeding program. Phil has spent decades looking at millions of wheat plants, and he can pretty much identify a winner from a loser just by looking at it. Don't ask me how, but there's something um, in, in this bit of kit right here that we try to reproduce with uh, machine vision and uh, photonics, uh, high-tech sensors, but still not quite there. So we're not going to get rid of Phil anytime soon either. Um, so those are two important things. But So we're not going to replace either of those ways of doing breeding using genomic selection, but we want to supplement that, make their job easier and faster. So uh, I mentioned the covariate, so it begins with field mapping using electromagnetic induction and applying all of those points on, on a plot basis, and that can help improve the accuracy of our predictions. Here's an image of, of the Cambridge site, one of, one of the two sites, and uh, that's 3,000 plots. And um, <clears throat> it's actually uh, worked very well. The R-squared um, uh, precision for the trial was 0.95 for yield, so that's good. And there's only two very obvious drilling, drilling errors, which I applaud our farm team for, for doing pretty well at that and the Duxford site as well. So they're very large trials, l larger than what we're used to, to working with, quite frankly, but not large for a breeding program. You've seen the photographs of UAVs, and, and these um, we've used routinely, um, using uh, standardized reflective surfaces to compensate for changes in radiation um, <clears throat> as best as we can. It's not perfect. And uh, uh, the company that we worked with for doing a hyperspectral imaging, um, we chose not to put a very expensive hyperspectral camera on a drone, uh, and we uh, put it on a plane instead. And um, <coughs> this uh, allowed us to collect the typical vegetation indices. Here's a list of 51 standard ones. Uh, but we also have the uh, corrected uh, uh, reflectance values at each wave band. And um, so I mentioned in the beginning that we were interested in, in phenotypic descriptors, not necessarily traits, because analogous to having genetic markers to understand the genotype, we want to have as many phenotypic markers to, to understand the, the phenotype. And it doesn't really matter what those markers are, um, all that, although we want to get as many as possible. According to John's simulation models, if we had 1,000 uh, phenotypic descriptors, that would work really well. And I said, well, there's NDVI, that's one. <laughs> and uh, so we're not going to quite reach what the simulation models really would like. Um, but with uh, hyperspectral imaging, you can at least get 120 data points. The important thing as well is that it doesn't really matter that lots of those um, points are intercorrelated. Lots of these vegetation indices are, have very high correlations in between them. Um, and it doesn't matter that each one of those explains only a small proportion of the variance in, in yield, because that's also true for single genetic markers. And finally, we don't really need to understand the biological meaning behind any of these uh, physiological descriptors, although that would be nice to understand what's going on. Uh, we, we heard a lot about hyperspectral imaging and the massive amounts of data that you uh, can accumulate. Just some images from the uh, manned aircraft. Uh, this is on a trial uh, before the, the actual experiment. Um, some false color images based on the different indices. This was an altitude of 1,000 meters, but on our trial we did it at 500 meters, which is about the lowest you can go, still maintain enough airspeed without the plane falling out of the air. 
Um, just a view now of the yield results, and this shows the the means for the for the crosses across all four of the breeding companies. Uh, none of them did as well as the leading uh, or one of the leading commercial varieties, but they they did do better than some of the other Czech varieties. And uh, in this histogram, you can see that there's a fair number of lines uh, that did better than that best Czech variety. The point being that we're working with really uh, good material and that it's relevant for the breeders and something that they can directly incorporate into their breeding programs. Uh, just a, a, a glance really at some of the uh, uh, spectral reflectance data. This is a ratio vegetation index, which is actually the simplest one. It's just red and infrared, and it shows a correlation to grain yield here. Uh, nothing that you could really lose a, use as a predictor of yield uh, on its own. It explains only a small proportion of the yield, but it shows the amount of variation you can, cap can capture. And again, we're not looking for these kinds of bivariate kinds of relationships, but putting all of the data together to develop an algorithm to describe the phenotype. And at the other side, uh, here's a pigment index. Might be related to anthocyanins, or might be related to the degree of senescence developing in the crop uh, at, at early grain fill. Um, just a, a, maybe to re reiterate it again, that NDVI around flowering when you're at full canopy cover isn't really much help as a descriptive yield. And in fact, uh, in this particular experiment we did before, this is a different population. Uh, there's no correlation between NDVI and yield. But this trial was actually split in two. Half of it was treated with fungicide and the other half wasn't. And you can't really tell which is which until you look at it with uh, uh, NDVI filters to look at um, the incidence of uh, just the beginning of rust infection and you can see uh, the untreated portion of the trial shows up quite well. And it's a very good way of getting quantitative data on the very early stages of rust um, infection in this uh, diversity panel. So in this particular case, uh, simple NDVI um, uh, measurements were quite useful. And that you know, shows the correlation, not surprisingly, with uh, low values of NDI in the VI were indicating uh, poor performing lines. So finally then, just to uh, maybe introduce uh, our attempts to look at phenotypes below the ground. So uh, all of the measures that we looked at so far uh, in the conference uh, for doing re phenotyping wouldn't really work very well on 3,000 plots. Uh, although we are holding uh, hope out for this one, this is using electromagnetic induction, the same technique we did with the soil mapping in the beginning, uh, but with a little bit of uh, changes in how it's used, uh, we can use it to estimate um, routing. So part of it is developing uh, the software to invert the apparent conductivity measurements to get a routing profile through the soil profile, and then <coughs> By, convince, uh, by turning the coils 90 degrees, you can get um, uh, measurements at six depths through the soil profile of conductivity, which is related to soil moisture content. So in this example, and this was work done with uh, my colleague uh, Richard Wally at Rothamsted, this shows the change in soil conductivity over the soil profile. Uh, which is related then to uh, root activity as roots remove soil moisture uh, from the soil profile. And this shows that the changes in conductivity over time, uh, there are genotypic differences uh, between uh, a small number of uh, varieties. Robigus, for instance, is extracting more water uh, from deeper in the soil profile than, for instance, a hybrid, which is actually uh, a bit surprising. So, and then finally, the other thing that we'd like to do uh, next year, but I'm not sure if we can, is the last slide, um, is to try and use a soil penetrometer. So as roots remove soil moisture, the soil hardens, uh, and you can measure that soil strength with a penetrometer. And using a hydraulically driven tractor-mounted uh, soil penetrometer, we're getting to the point where we can use uh, high throughput measurements of soil penetration resistance as a surrogate measure for root activity, particularly in the upper soil layers. So uh, opportunities for this project, uh, a large scale, we can test genomic selection methods, uh, something relevant for commercial uh, breeders. Uh, 
can test, test trial designs and training population size, and um, ho hopefully then also utilize uh, EMI for uh, doing root phenotyping at this scale. Just to acknowledge our collaborators and the uh, companies that we're working with uh, in this uh, project. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for two quick questions. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering, because you will have the, for all genotypes, so the observed and the unobserved, you have the markers, but you only have the phenotypes, so the NDVI or the other traits for the ones that are in the training set. So I was wondering, could you explain a little bit uh, more on how you are going to integrate this to improve the prediction of the genotypes in the test set? So, so uh, the 3,000 lines will be both the training set and the reference set. So they'll, so everything will be genotyped and phenotype, and then it will be using masking and cutting that population up in different ways so that part of it will be the training and then part of it will be the reference. Does that make sense? In reality, in a breeding program, you don't have those phenotypes. So how would you do it then? <coughs> yeah, so the real test of it will be when the breeders can apply those algorithms in their own um, breeding populations and then to test it in a real reference population. But in our case, we'll pretend that, that those 3,000 lines and divide them up to do the training and reference within those 3,000. Just uh, here, uh, with that electrical conductivity experiment that you did with your um, uh, electrical conductivity experiment and your results, did you observe or notice any effect of uh, the soil um, composition difference from one side of the plot to the other? Does it affect the results at all? Uh, I'm, I'm sure it does. And hopefully with some of the soil mapping, we can uh, take that into consideration as a covariant. Just a quick one. I'm quite impressed about the fungicide, non-fungicide plot there. Um, was fungicide applied as a prophylactic or as a growth regulator? Um, just because both happen. And then the second thing is, how early can you actually pick up those differences with a hyperspectral camera? Because that was that was quite vivid, actually, and uh, you know, r relating to what we heard earlier on. Um, you know, there may be some possibilities for uh, using techniques like that in order to uh, to actually get treatment at an early enough period. Uh, yeah, there's just a normal prophylactic fungicide program. Uh, if you were standing in the plots, uh, you could you could see the the rust developing, but uh, it was quite subtle actually. So it's not pre pre symptomatic disease detection. We're not quite there with this yet. Okay, thank you very much.